We're delighted to have with us today uh, Professor Carter Sneed, who's Professor of Law, a concurrent professor of political science and the director of the De Nicola Centre for Ethics and Culture at the University of Notre Dame. His publications include What It Means to Be Human, uh, The Case for the Body and Public Bioethics, which was named by the Wall Street Journal as one of the 10 best books of 2020. So without any further ado, I will hand over um, to you, Carter. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Helen and uh, and Ilaria and all of the wonderful people at the, the Bio Center. And, and uh, it's a pleasure to be with you today, uh, albeit uh, virtually. And my, I understand that my charge for today is to talk to you all about the recent decision of the Supreme Court of the United States and the Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health uh, Organization. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very significant change in the jurisprudence of abortion in America, which of course began in 1973 with, uh, with Roe versus Wade. Uh, the Dobbs court uh, in a six to three decision affirmed the Mississippi, the challenge Mississippi law is constitutional, which is a big thing in itself. I'll explain more granularly what, what that means in a moment. But more importantly than that, uh, in a five, five of the justices joined in a majority opinion to overturn uh, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, which are the two principal sources of authority uh, governing abortion uh, in the United States, and then re which effectively returns the question of abortion back to the political branches of government um, at the state level, uh, probably less likely at the federal level, so that each individual state can decide for itself through the democratic process what its policy on abortion should be. Some of them will restrict abortion significantly. Some of them will promote abortion, already have actually, uh, and there'll be many positions in between. So uh, by returning the matter to the political process, uh, what the Supreme Court just did, in, in, in short, is to place the United States on the same footing as countries around the world, including the United Kingdom, that govern themselves on the question of abortion through the political process. Um, so let me uh, let me speak for about a half an hour, I think. Um, I'll give you an overview. I'll have to go rather quickly and, and give you a cursory account because it's about 50 years of jurisprudence to cover uh, in a short period of time. Um, but, but let me just briefly sketch out for you what Roe v. Wade held what Planned Parenthood versus Casey held and what the kind and make a few remarks about the general arc of American abortion jurisprudence from 1973 to the present. Uh, and then we'll, I'll talk about the Dobbs decision. And then, of course, we can have a conversation as, as the hosts uh, prefer. So I'm going to share my screen with you now. Um, I have, well, let's see here. I thought I had it. Um, let me pull this up. I apologize. Okay, here we go. Um, I will share my screen with you. It's just a don't be alarmed by the number of slides. This is this is a, a slide presentation that's meant to be about um, ninety minutes long. There are eighty-one slides. I will not do, do a ninety-minute set piece for you all on Zoom. I would not inflict that upon you. Uh, just give me one sec here. Okay, so let me just briefly run through this and and explore uh, for the audience. Uh, what American abortion jurisprudence has been for the past 50 years and what the operational legal mechanisms to put that in place have been. So uh, until very recently, until a few weeks ago, uh, the way to understand the law and policy of abortion in America, you'd have to understand the substance of a handful of Supreme Court opinions, really functionally two uh, Supreme Court opinions, Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, they almost entirely established for the United States uh, a comprehensive scheme for abortion regulation um, that uh, the states could not depart from. Uh, the, the, the scheme allowed sort of minor um, uh, ancillary limitations on abortion, but it couldn't. No state could restrict abortion in any significant way because of these Supreme Court decisions. Um, there were eight. There are eight, basically eight decisions in this arc of jurisprudence. We're going to focus on Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey very briefly, and then we'll continue to, to the Dobbs decision. Now, it's important to begin with to understand what the court un understands itself to be doing in these cases. Okay, The Supreme Court of the United States has the authority to interpret the Constitution of the United States, the written Constitution of the United States, and to apply its provisions to um, different questions involving state action. Okay, the the Constitution uh, 
uh, establishes the authority of the federal government, which is in principle limited authority, limited to what the enumerated powers in the written constitution are. And all, the rest of the authority, uh, legal authority in America is exercised in a plenary way by the 50 individual states themselves. So the states, each state has a lot of authority to regulate in different different aspects of, of life. And in particular, uh, the regulation of the practice of medicine has traditionally been within the ambit of the states themselves. The federal government has had very little involvement in regulating the practice of medicine in the states. Um, and prior to 1973, the issue of abortion was not considered to be a constitutional question. Um, Again, the, the court's limited role in our system of government is to read the Constitution, to interpret it, and to compare state action against the strictures of the Constitution, and then to invalidate those state actions, uh, whether it be the state or federal level, that conflict with the guarantees of the Constitution itself. So the Constitution creates our government. It sets uh, the different branches of government in relation to one another, both at the federal level, the federal and the state governments. That's sort of a vertical kind of federalism. And then there's horizontal federalism. The Constitution establishes the relationship between the different co-equal branches of the federal government, the executive branch in which the president sits at the top, um, the uh, legislative branch, U.S. Congress, and then, of course, the judiciary, uh, which is, is led by the U.S., the Supreme Court of the United States. And then there are a bunch of inferior federal courts that have been established by statute, okay? Then there's the Bill of Rights, and then there's a series of additional amendments which speak to individual guarantees uh, of, of persons and individuals uh, that they have uh, guarantees and protections that they enjoy against state action. Things like freedom of speech, freedom of association, um, the right against unreasonable searches and seizures by law enforcement authorities, the right to be free from being compelled to be a witness against yourself in a criminal trial. These are all laid out specifically in the uh, individual amendments themselves. And they bind both the federal government and the state governments uh, in a way that prevents them from transgressing those guarantees. The freedom of exercise of religion, for example, is another example. Um, so the court's job, and again, it's important to remind yourself of this when we think about abortion jurisprudence, is to read the constitution and then evaluate what the state has done and ask a simple question, does the state action at issue violate the Constitution in some way? And if it does, the court exercises judicial review and it invalidates what the state has done. And the state has to go sort of back to the drawing board to figure out how it wants to pursue whatever its goals are uh, in light of the court's decision. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of dispute among justices and judges and legal scholars about how to interpret the Constitution, how limited the role of the court should be in interpreting the Constitution. Uh, one dominant approach uh, called originalism uh, dictates that the judges and justices should read the Constitution in light of its original understanding, or read, the, read the provisions in light of the way that they were originally understood. And the reason for this mode of judicial interpretation is, because, is, is sort of twofold. One, and most fundamentally, it accords with what these judges and justices think law is. Law is meant to be a static bulwark against, especially constitutional law, a static bulwark against popular changing attitudes. Uh, the judges and justices can't change the meaning of the law as times change, as, po as different views come into vogue, uh, according to different forms of political pressure that might be brought to bear on them. Our judges and justices in the federal system have are appointed for life. They are not elected. They are not politically accountable. They're politically insulated so that they will, re they will be resistant to uh, the temptation to do whatever is politically popular at the moment. So it's, a, it's by design a counter-majoritarian institution. And so originalism is consistent with that idea, the idea that the law is the law, it's a fixed point, and the law can be changed, of course, uh, if it's it's merely statutory law, it can be changed by the legislative and political branches of government. If it's regulatory law, the executive branch can make modifications. And if it's constitutional changes that are sought, there is a process. It's a cumbersome process, but a process that's set forth in the Constitution to, to, to sort out how exactly that can be done. And originalism is meant to be a mode of interpretation that is consistent with the idea that judges and justices are not supposed to be politicians. They're not, to suppo they're not supposed to impose their own preferred preference preferences on the country. They're not to be activists in this way. They are merely there to have the limited role of reading the Constitution in light of its original understanding and then applying its, its meaning. Uh, and, it does, and that's not meant to fix the realities of the, the Constitution, like in a, in a sort of freeze it in amber in terms of 
uh, the time it was enacted, 19th century, 18th century, depending on the provision you're talking about, even 20th century. But also, um, because there are methods, it's it's simply a dis dispute about who whose job it is to change the law. Not it's not the court's job to change the law. It is the leg the political branches of government's job to change the law through the democratic process. So that's originalism. On the other side, you have a much more flexible understanding of the judge's role in which judges can interpret the constitution in a much more sort of creative way and bring to bear what the justices and judges think of as evolving standards and different points of view and to interpret the constitutional provisions in light of those changed attitudes and opinions and policy preferences. Sometimes this is referred to as constitutional dynamism. Sometimes it's talked about as the living constitution model. And again, the virtue of this model is it provides a lot of flexibility uh, in interpreting the Constitution. And uh, but the, the the downside and the risk of that mode of interpretation and, and why it's criticized by originalist judges is that it provides essentially no limit on what the unelected judge or justice can do in terms of changing the law based on his or her own policy preferences. And that essentially transforms the role of a judge or justice into a kind of super political branch of government that, that applies its own opinions and imposes those opinions without the political accountability that the elected branches of government have. Okay, So that's a very broad uh, and rough sketch of the competing perspectives on what the court does when it interprets the Constitution. And the reason I bring that up is because Roe v. Wade is an especially controversial example of justices applying the second model of interpretation. That is, reading into the Constitution their own views about what public policy should look like, okay? Uh, and it's been highly criticized, Roe v. Wade, since 1973, including by liberal and progressive jurists and judges and legal scholars who thought that the court really overstepped its bounds in discovering a right to abortion in the Constitution, even though it was nowhere mentioned in the Constitution, even though the concept of privacy that it relied upon is, of course, not mentioned in the Constitution and the precedents relating to privacy that it relied on are, are quite different from the, the, the factual context in which abortion arises. Issues involving contraception or marriage or family, uh, child rearing and so forth, those are distinguishable from the factual context of abortion because they don't involve the intentional destruction of a living human organism in utero, which of course is the source of moral controversy and legal and policy controversy surrounding the issue of abortion. Okay, so, um, so the court in Roe v. Wade, and let me just say one more thing. Um, the state of the law on abortion in the United States up until the moment Roe v. Wade was decided uh, was looked a lot more like uh, countries around the world, right? Most countries around the world restrict abortion, um, usually according to a gestational stage, 12 weeks, 15 weeks. Uh, you know, some, some jurisdictions go a little bit later into gestational development uh, to limit the, the pregnancy, but they restrict abortion. Sometimes they restrict the reasons for which abortions can be obtained. And in the United States, at common law during the nation's founding, and in England prior to the to to the uh, to the American founding um, and the colonial era in the United States, abortion was forbidden. It was criminally prosecuted after what was described as the st uh, the state of quickening, uh, the point at which the unborn child or the fetus could be detected by virtue of his or her movements inside um, his or her mother's womb. Um, there's some discussion about why quickening was the was the ben the benchmark um, for criminal prosecution of abortion at common law. Uh, some of the arguments relate to um, the, simply the uh, matters of proof, criminal proof. It would be impossible for a prosecutor to prove the uh, the, the the actus reus, the, the 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 criminal act of taking the life of the unborn child when that when that child's vital signs were undetectable by the technologies available at the time. So quickening was a kind of um, was a useful point in the process that could be identified for the purposes of evidentiary proof by the prosecutor. Others have suggested that perhaps it has to do with uh, the state of understanding of embryological development at that time, that people had a sort of an idea that the fetus was substantively one thing prior to quickening and something different after that. Um, it's not entirely clear uh, why that was. But even prior to quickening, by the way, at common law in England and in, in the US, um, abortion was strongly legally disfavored. Uh, contracts for abortion would be voided as, as uh, against public policy 
uh, houses and institutions that performed abortion would be shut down by the authorities. And most interestingly, abortion was considered a predicate for what we in the United States call felony murder. If you uh, accidentally kill someone in uh, in the normal course of affairs, you might be uh, uh, liable for negligent killing. Uh, you might be even charged with manslaughter if it's a, if it, if, if you accidentally kill someone, say in a car accident. However, uh, that's treated differently from murder, which is the intentional killing of a person with malice aforethought. Uh, but at common law, if you were performing an abortion on a woman and the woman died, that death would be treated as a homicide, which means that the context of abortion may was considered felonious, such that you would be prosecuted for homicide if the woman died. If you were a practitioner and you were doing, a, say, an appendectomy on a woman and you negligently caused her death, you wouldn't be charged with homicide because the underlying appendectomy would not be treated as a felonious predicate. But abortion was treated that way. So abortion has always been significantly treated as a lawful wrong at common law prior to quickening and a crime post-quickening, and as I say, as a predicate for felony murder prior to quickening as well. Well, in the 19th century uh, in the United States, jurisdictions began to codify criminal laws against abortion. It was, it was unlawful at common law, but they started to codify statutes that banned abortion, and most of these abortions were banned at conception. And the justification for that given by the legislatures at issue were to, um, to protect the life of the unborn child, which they regarded as a human person who deserved protection of law from the moment of conception forward. So that was in the, the beginning, middle of the 19th century. And why am I talking about this? In 1868, the United States ratified the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. It was after the Civil War, uh, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were adopted to cure the wicked and shameful acts and be responsive to chattel slavery in America, which gave rise to the Civil War. Um, and it, it was in 1868 that the 14th Amendment was ratified. The 14th Amendment has multiple clauses. The clause that we're going to be most concerned about in our conversation is what's called the Due Process Clause. The Due Process Clause says that no person should be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. And um, it was enacted at a time in which abortion was a crime in three fourths by, by statute, it was a crime from the moment of conception. And of course it was a crime at common law elsewhere uh, during, uh, during the, the time of ratification. And those states that ratified, that adopted the 14th amendment, all banned abortion from the moment of conception uh, and then continued to tighten their laws up even in the decades that followed 1868, such that you fast forward up until the middle of the 20th century, in the latter part of the 20th century, right before Roe v. Wade was decided, and most states, 30 states, banned abortion, criminalized abortion from conception, 30 out of 50, and then the rest banned, had significant restrictions on abortion, even though it didn't ban it outright. They had significant restrictions. Some were gestational, others were circumstantially based. But in any event, up until the moment Roe v. Wade was decided, abortion was restricted in America and had been throughout our history and was explicitly criminalized from conception beginning in the 19th century, including the time at which the, 8th, the 14th Amendment was adopted. Okay, so that's the state of affairs prior to Roe v. Wade being announced. Um, and, which, which, and the reason I bring all that up is because in the court in Roe, they were considering a, a Texas statute, which looked an awful lot like the laws around the country that banned abortion, except in those cases where the continued pregnancy posed a threat to the life of the mother. Now, I should also point out that women were not prosecuted for abortion in the United States under these laws. Uh, there are three examples that I've been able to find of prosecutions, which are the exception of the rule, uh, 1922, uh, 1911, and 1973, all of which, all of which were uh, voided, all the convictions were voided by um, uh, the, the Court of Appeals. So there's never been a, a conviction that I've ever been able to find in my study of American history of a woman for abortion that was not vacated on appeal. There are only three prosecutions that I was able to find and all of them were vacated on appeal. So just to be clear, women during this regime were not prosecuted for abortion, except in three circumstances that I found and those, those convictions were, were reversed. So what the court looks at this, the court looks at the case in Roe and says, we believe that the laws restricting abortion in America implicate an unenumerated, meaning unwritten, fundamental right to privacy 
that is implicit in the due process clause of the 14th Amendment. And I've already said that the due process clause says just this, no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now you can look at that language and you would be surprised and you probably are surprised to learn that that language adopted in 1868 when abortion was banned everywhere was read by the court in Roe v. Wade to support a right to abortion. Um, and uh, a lot of people were surprised by that on the left, right, and center. And the court inferred this holding through the doctrine of what is called substantive due process. That is, the court reads that language and, 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 and believes that it can identify uh, under this doctrine, which is very controversial, they believe they can identify substantive rights that are implicit in that due process language. So then the question becomes, how do you find those rights? And how does the court engage this substantive due process doctrine without losing its own legitimacy by simply imposing its own policy preferences? What are the limiting principles? How can the court tether itself to the constitution? Um, and, and there are different suggestions as to how it might do it. Looking at prior precedents, the court says, okay, we have these prior precedents involving zones of privacy. They involve marriage, they involve procreation, they involve contraception, they involve education of children and child rearing. And Justice Blackman just sort of says, well, you've got this zone of privacy. We think that it also includes abortion. Now, that was surprising to some people as well, because a lot of folks who accepted the notion of a right to privacy and accepted the idea that marriage and procreation and uh, contraception, the use of contraception by married couples, which was the issue in Griswold versus Connecticut, the right to child rearing and so on, were all protected by a right to privacy. But abortion was different from those areas, as I said earlier, in that it involved the right to take the life of a nascent human organism in utero, and it had been criminalized explicitly since, uh, well, certainly since the 19th century, but was also criminalized post-quickening and legally disfavored before that at common law. So no one from, really from this nation's founding up until 1973 thought that the constitution took a position on abortion. No one thought that it forbade the states or the federal government from extending any protections of the law to the unborn child. And so the court, so it was surprising the court in Roe says, oh yeah, there's a right to abortion in the constitution. And then they said, this right is a fundamental right. It's gonna enjoy the strongest protections we have to offer. Um, and, um, and then again, just to be clear, what the court, and, and the way the court arrives at this conclusion is by saying there must be a right to abortion. There must be a right to abortion because the unique burdens of unplanned pregnancy, not just pregnancy, but also parenthood fall so uniquely and, 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 and harshly on the woman's shoulders that she must have a right to abortion. Otherwise, our entire regime won't be fundamentally fair. But of course, you'll, you, those of you who are students of bioethics will realize, well, yeah, that's not a surprising argument, but it, it, what's surprising is that it entirely misses the, the, the interests on the other side of the equation. It doesn't do any, um, doesn't explain how to think about the relationship between these maternal burdens and parental burdens versus the, the interest, the state's interest in the uh, in the life of the unborn child or other interests like regulating the practice of medicine for ethical integrity or uh, preserving maternal health, et cetera, et cetera. It's simply a one-sided account of the maternal interest at issue, which are very important, but entirely leaves aside the second piece and then implicitly decides, by the way, that the constitution forbids the states from adopting a theory of personhood that sets the unborn child on roughly even an equal footing with the interests of his or her mother. So the court is taking a view that the Constitution of the United States has a theory of personhood in it that is um, that, uh, that that requires a right to abortion. And then it goes even further and says, we will articulate a trimester framework within which the state's interests uh, will be measured differently according to the gestational stage of the pregnancy itself. In the first trimester of pregnancy, the state may not interfere with the right to abortion. In the second trimester of pregnancy, the state may regulate abortion, but only to do so for the sake of promoting maternal health. And then it finally is in the third trimester of pregnancy, roughly uh, continuous with the notion of viability, that states can regulate abortion, but they have to include an exception for the woman's life, which all the statutes did anyway, or her health, which was undefined, but appeared to encompass a wide array of interests, not merely physical or even emotional health relating to the pregnancy, but also economic health, familial health, social health that relate to unplanned parenthood after the child is already born. 
Okay. So now again, we have to remind ourselves, what does the court think it's doing here? It's, it, it's, it's, it's ostensibly interpreting the 14th Amendment, and it's reading into the 14th Amendment not only a right to privacy, not only a right to abortion, but also this kind of Byzantine trimester framework, which is also supposed to be arising out of its constitutional interpretation. So you can understand why Roe was so controversial, because it simply invented this right to abortion and then created this framework that it imposed on every state in the country uh, swept away all state laws of every sort, short-circuited the political process, and imposed this kind of one-size-fits-all approach under a very specious reading of the 14th Amendment. Okay, so um, let's fast forward to 1992, in which the court thought, it looked like the court was going to reevaluate Roe v. Wade, um, and but however, in a five to four decision, a fractured five to four decision, evaluating a series of laws from the state of Pennsylvania, some of which had been invalidated in previous Supreme Court opinions under Roe, uh, an informed consent law, a uh, 24 hour waiting period, the parental consent provision for minors seeking abortions with a judicial bypass provision. There was a spousal notification provision and some others as well. It doesn't so much matter uh, what these provisions were as to notice that they are side constraints on abortion. They're not bans on abortion as such, they're simply side constraints. And what the court held in a fractured decision, three judges in a plurality, so there's a five to four decision, the judges, some judges dissented, some judges concurred, but the opinion for the court was a three judge plurality opinion, which said it affirmed the core holding of Roe v. Wade. Um, but then even though it said it affirmed the core holding of Roe v. Wade, it changed it quite a bit. Um, to it, it downgraded the right to abortion from fundamental to a protected liberty interest. It, it shifted the normative justification from privacy to liberty. And then it replaced the trimester framework with a pre versus post viability dichotomy. That is prior to viability, the court said the state may not unduly burden a woman's right to abortion. It can manage access to abortion, but it can't fundamentally prohibit a woman from seeking abortion prior to viability. After viability, the state could restrict abortion, but it has to include these exceptions for uh, life, of course, but also health. And the health exception is still quite broad and capacious to essentially operate to, to, to limit any restrictions the state might impose. Okay. Now, the court said, again, here in Casey, that not, it's not a privacy interest that drives their analysis, but a liberty interest. And they talked in, in similar terms to Roe about the woman's um, freedom and the unique burdens of pregnancy and parenthood and how the state can't impose its own view of the moral standing of the unborn child to override a woman's judgment about what her future requires and that her future, uh, her future standing as an economic and social matter depends on her being able to get abortion when men uh, get engaged in the same kind of forms of sexual expression uh, are not burdened in the way that women are, and therefore they need access to abortion to, to level the playing field, if you will. Um, so the court gave a kind of normative legal justification for um, quite a little bit different from what the court said in Roe, and then it gave us an entirely different standard and, and totally new standard, the, the viability undue burden standard. They changed the classification of the right. They changed the normative justification for the right, et cetera. And, and the question is, why did they need feel the need to reaffirm Roe? Uh, and much of the opinion and much of the argument after Casey focuses on the principle of what we call stare decisis. In any common law system, judges are invited to consider the, 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 um, the um, practical consequences of overturning a prior precedent that they regard as wrongly decided. They consider elements like, well, has the prior precedent, was it not merely wrongly decided, but was it egregiously wrongly decided? Has the opinion proven to be unworkable? Uh, has it created instability in the system? Have people come to rely on the the uh, the decision um, that in a way that would disrupt their reliance if we were to change the decision now? Have facts changed? Has the doctrine been abandoned or hollowed out? And they concluded, again, contrary to the dissent's argument, that no, all these elements of stare decisis are important to sustaining what they called the core holding of Roe, even though it wasn't the same reasoning. And let me to be clear, in the jurisprudence of stare decisis, uh, justices and judges are not permitted to reinvent a right uh, for the sake of preserving an outcome. They are simply invited to preserve the entirety of the prior decision. And the court, in, in, in Casey, doesn't even do that. So as a, as a precedent on stare decisis, Casey was controversial because it didn't really apply stare decisis in the way that had been traditionally applied in the past. Um, but the final thing 
the court says, and this is important for current understanding, uh, the court said our legitimacy, our reputation for legitimacy depends on sustaining Roe v. Wade because it'll look like we're capitulating to political pressure uh, otherwise. Now, the court doesn't notice the sort of obvious rejoinder to that, which the dissent makes, which is, well, won't you also look like you're capitulating to political pressure if you reaffirm an egregiously wrongly decided opinion that's been proven to be unworkable because you don't want the political consequences of doing that? Um, the, but the court didn't see that sort of second side of the zero sum conflict and nevertheless relied on its own judgment about what the politics required. Um, okay, so between 1992, here we go real fast in the intervening years, um, between 1992 and 2022, uh, there was a series of other decisions involving abortion and um, and and in those decisions, it seemed like the court was changing the rules even yet again. In 2016, the court seemed to adopt an even different approach from the Casey decision. It was a very fractured decision. It was, five, it was, a, it was a five to three decision uh, in which the court says, you know what? Casey requires the judges and justices just to balance the benefits of the challenge law versus the burdens of the challenge law and to decide if it's a, a constitutional or not. That's even more un unbounded than Casey and Roe. And the court appeared to adopt that view in 2016. But then four years later in 2020, in a case called June Medical Services, uh, in an even more fractured opinion, a 4-1-4 four, uh, four, four fractured, you had nine justices in the court, four justices articulating what they thought the rule in abortion should be. You had a, a concurring opinion from the chief justice, which took a different view. And then, of course, you had the dissenting justices, which goes to show uh, an important point here. From 1973 until 2022, or sorry, 2022, we had... Uh, a right to abortion that was invented by the court in Roe in 1973. And every few years, the court would revisit the question, change the rule a little bit. They would change the rationale a little bit. They would change the standards a little bit, such that the state legislatures really never had any idea as to what they were and were not permitted to do. Because the abortion jurisprudence was so unstable, it was constantly shifting and I, I would attribute that to the fact that it never had firm footing in the Constitution to begin with. There is no right to abortion in the Constitution. There's nothing in the text, history, or tradition that supports that. It's simply a made up right by justices on the bench. And then, and every few years, the court changes and manipulates its doctrine to try to come up with a more persuasive reason for what it's, is ultimately a kind of a post hoc rationalization of, of, a, of an outcome that they prefer. Okay. So, fast forward all the way to 2022. And I'll, I'll wrap up pretty quickly here. Up to 2022, you have um, Mississippi passes a law that bans abortion after 15 weeks. Okay. Now that is a pretty modest law. It captures a very small percentage of abortions. Most abortions take place before 15 weeks. Most countries around the world uh, limit abortion uh, even slightly before uh, 15 weeks. But what's perfectly clear is that 15 weeks is prior to viability. And Planned Parenthood versus Casey, no matter what else it said, said you can't ban abortion prior to viability. And so the court granted a uh, review of the following question. Uh, when, when Mississippi passed this law and the law was struck down as violating Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court at, agreed to hear the question of whether or not all pre-viability prohibitions on elective abortions are unconstitutional. Now, anyone who's read Planned Parenthood versus Casey in the subsequent cases would know, even if even if you don't quite have a sense of how abortion laws, what, what's going to be permissible and what's not, you know that that one's not permissible. You know that a 15-week ban is not permissible because it's prior to viability. So the court was presented basically with a binary choice. You either affirm Roe v. Wade and Casey and you strike down the Mississippi 15-week ban, or you affirm the ban as constitutional and reverse Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey and return the question of abortion to the political branches. And interestingly, on both sides of the dispute, the, the, the Attorney General's Office from Mississippi and those advocates defending abortion rights and the abortion clinic in Mississippi both agreed with each other that there was no middle position. The phrase that the US government used was there are no, the federal government uh, representing the Biden administration argued there is no ha there are no half measures available here. You either strike down that Mississippi law uh, and you affirm Roe and Casey, or you uphold the law and you strike down and reverse Roe and Casey. And the court opted for the latter, okay? Um, and so the court, uh, the, there was a leak of an un unprecedented leak of the opinion, which basically became the opinion of the court. 
Um, and the court issued an opinion a few weeks ago confirming what the substance of the leak was. Justice Alito and, five, and four of his colleagues overturned Roe v. Wade and Casey. They returned the matter to the political branches who are permitted to regulate or ban abortion. State laws restricting abortion will be sub, uh, subject to a very deferential standard of review by the court. Uh, the court went out of its way to say there's no effect at all of our decision in, a, in this case um, on uh, <coughs> other enumerated rights, like the right to same-sex marriage, the right to contraception, all of those rights are exactly uh, the same. You need not worry about those arguments. That we're simply focusing on abortion because abortion is distinguishable from those areas in that it involves the intentional destruction of, uh, of a nascent human life. Uh, the court, um, in its due process analysis, said justices are not permitted simply to ask the question of whether or not a particular right is important or, or, or valuable or, or deemed essential in their own policy judgment, but rather substantive due process analysis has to be limited uh, in the following way. Only those rights, only those unwritten rights that are deeply rooted in America's history and tradition and essential to our scheme of ordered liberty, only those rights will be deemed uh, unenumerated rights that the 14th Amendment protects, okay? And so then the question becomes, was the court correct in 73 in saying that the right to abortion is deeply rooted in our history and tradition? And the answer, and this isn't really even a hard question, was no. Prior to, the 20th, prior to late in the 20th century, there was never a right to abortion of any sort. Abortion was a crime and uh, and legally disfavored at common law, as I said before, and then criminalized by statute from the moment of conception at the moment when the 14th Amendment was ratified. And that was true up until 1973. And as of the day Roe was decided, 30 states banned abortion from conception forward and others imposed restrictions that Roe v. Wade would sweep away, in its opinion. And in the Dobbs case, 26 states, that's a majority of states in the United States, filed briefs before the court in Dobbs in 2020 and 2021, asking for Roe v. Wade to be overturned. So it's perfectly clear that there was never a right to abortion at any point in American history, much less a fundamental right to abortion prior to viability with a trimester framework or whatever the court invented in Roe and Casey. It's simply not the case. Um, the court also said that the right to abortion is not part of, part of a broader liberty or privacy right that uh, was announced in other precedents. Uh, abortion implicates actions and ordered liberty permits states to have different judgments about balancing and competing goods. The past precedents on marriage and contraception and child rearing are all distinguishable because they don't involve the intentional taking of a prenatal human life. The court is, there is no theory of personhood in the constitution that forbids the states from promoting abortion or restricting abortion. Uh, Justice Kavanaugh in a concurring opinion said, <laughs> that the, the Constitution is scrupulously neutral on the question of abortion. Abortion is, is, is left for the political process. Okay, so what about stare decisis? What about the fact that the, the, the law had been in place, or Roe v. Wade had been not overturned since 1973? Well, the court goes through stare decisis and explains that stare decisis considerations are weakest in constitutional cases, um, there's a rich and important tradition of overturning prior precedents. A perfect example is Brown versus Board of Education, which overturned 58 years of precedent, establishing the heinous separate but equal doctrine that allowed states to segregate schools by race. An entire region of the country had school system based on the Plessy versus Ferguson holding, which said separate but equal is constitutional. And in Brown versus Board of Education, the court said, no, it's not, and eliminated 58 years of jurisprudence and destabilized the entire school system of the Southeastern United States as a result. So there's a rich tradition of overturning prior precedents. You look at the nature of the court's error, which was egregious and grievous for reasons that I just explained. You look at the quality of the reasoning, which is famously problematic. You look at the workability of the rules, which the, the, the rules of abortion that the court had invented and revised every couple decades had proven to be unworkable. Uh, it created a highly unstable system where no one quite knew and even the justices didn't agree about what the precedents required. And um, there would be no disruptive effects on other areas of the law, although there were disruptive effects on abortion jurisprudence generally. If the case involved abortion and a longstanding doctrine, the court would always depart from that longstanding doctrine so long as the right to abortion were affirmed. So for example, First Amendment cases involving free expression, you could have a line of jurisprudence that would result in protecting speech, 
But if the case were abortion, they would restrict speech. Uh, issues involving the standing to sue, be, the legal answer would be clear. Yes, this party has standing to sue, but the context was abortion. They would say the party doesn't have standing to sue. So it disrupted and corrupted other areas of the law as well. And then finally, the court concluded that reliance under principles of stare decisis has always been understood as a backwards looking doctrine. Is The question is not do people going forward need to make use of this right articulated invented by the court, but rather looking backwards and saying, are there settled interests, usually commercial or economic interests, that were taken in reliance on the prior precedent such that they would now be disrupted and undone if we change the precedent? It was a backwards looking doctrine, not a forwards looking doctrine. So in this way, Casey's understanding of stare decisis was unusual and, and not defensible. OK, so finally, Justice Alito says, going forward, the standard for evaluating state abortion restrictions will be the highly deferential, rational basis standard of review. States will be able to regulate abortion for legitimate reasons pursuant to rational means. There will be a strong presumption of validity. And what might those legitimate interests be? He goes out of his way to say uh, the preservation of and respect for prenatal life at all stages, including from conception forward, protection of maternal health, elimination of gruesome or barbaric abortion procedures to preserve the integrity of the medical profession, the mitigation of pain, uh, fetal pain, as well as preventing sex-based, racial, or disability-based discrimination. All of those are legitimate interests. The state can ban abortion pursuant to pursuing those goods. So that is uh, a very long uh, account, although not as long as it might have been, of the how we got to where we are now in the context of abortion, what the jurisprudence um, looked like, how it's changed, and what the future uh, might hold as a matter of law. So thank you for your attention. That was a, I appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Carter, for that uh, very rich um, uh, explanation of a very complicated topic. Um, I'll now open this to the to discussion. Um, is anyone, would anyone like to kick off? Thank you very much, for Danny, for coming. Uh, Uh, Matthew. Hi, can you hear me? I can. Hi. Uh, thank you for your, your very interesting talk. Um, so in the Dobbs decision, uh, Justice Thomas's concurrence um, takes issues with the court's refusal to disavow substantive due process um, and you really revise its 14th Amendment 14th Amendment jurisprudence. Um, what's your take on that? Do you think that the court should have gone as far as Justice Thomas? Um, or was it was it better for the court to say, actually, we'll kind of keep that substantive due process in place for cases like a burger fell um, and then just treat abortion differently? Yeah, thanks for the question. So uh, you're right. Justice Thomas is, is really a, a party of one on the court out of nine. Who takes the view that he that he does in that opinion? He has been a long-standing critic of substantive due process. He is a very um, he doesn't think it's legitimate at all. His view is that that there should be no substantive due process. Uh, that all of those precedents should be reconsidered. Uh, and again, his view is an outlier even among the conservatives on the court. Uh, their view was that um, substantive due process, um, at least implicitly is a feature of American abortion, American jurisprudence, not just about abortion, not even about just social questions, but also issues relating to criminal procedure, issues relating to punitive damages in the context of torts. Substantive due process is, is a, a part of our uh, the fabric of our constitutional law in the United States. And I gather, they didn't say as much, but I gather they would, they would regard it, either, either they don't regard it as sort of uh, in principle, illegitimate the way Justice Thomas does, or they believe that it would be so destabilizing to the fabric of the law to simply abandon this 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 concept that they opted not to not to join him in that in that opinion. Um, and frequently, I, I do think it's always it's often wise for the justices to <clears throat> resolve uh, an opinion, resolve a dispute as justices on sort of the narrowest grounds possible to be able to, and that's consistent, I think, with a kind of modest view of what the justices should should do in, as, as their role in government uh, stands. And I think I probably associate myself more with the notion of 
a limited role for the justices and judges. And if it's possible, and again, we have a case and controversy requirement in the United States law such that the only question that you're permitted to resolve is the question at issue that arises in the case itself. And it seems to me that one could dispense with the dispute in this case without opening the question of substantive due process more generally. And the fact that Justice Alito and Kavanaugh and others uh, underscored the fact that these other precedents involving same-sex marriage and contraception and interracial marriage would be undisturbed suggests to me it's not merely a matter of prudence. I think they probably are uh, not, a, they probably don't share Justice Thomas's view that the entire enterprise of substantive process is illegitimate. Um, I have a question. Uh, when I read the Justice uh, Kavanaugh concurring opinion, I mean, it echoed very much uh, a ruling by the um, European Court of Human Rights emphasizing a neutrality. Uh, and uh, do you think that uh, uh, in a way the US Supreme Court is going towards uh, the European framework on sensitive issues when it comes to, I mean, abortion, marriage, in a sense that it tries to give a kind of margin of appreciation, margin of appreciation. as the yeah. of the court as the court of Strasbourg uh, use, uh, uses to, to do in these circumstances. It would be very interesting to examine the jurisprudence of the margin of appreciation against in the way we would describe it in our system is, is federalism, right? Yes, the idea, yes, yes. the idea that, um, that, that, that there, that the Congress, the U S Congress, the federal government is a government of limited powers, enumerated powers. <laughs> and most of the power in America is reposed in each state. And um, one of the virtues of federalism is that different states with different views of contested questions can do different things. Um, and I think that that's an interesting uh, parallel that you draw there. I, I do think it's fair to say that the justices um, in the majority, uh, and also I think Chief Justice Roberts as well, take the view that uh, most of the most contentious questions are best resolved at the state level. Um, and uh, and therefore there should be a kind of, uh, we have the laboratory of the states to to pursue different approaches and and, and that's certainly the view that, that comes across in this opinion. I mean, Justice Kavanaugh says very explicitly, states that like abortion can promote abortion. They can fund abortion. <laughs> Whereas states that dislike it can ban it. Uh, and that's that's the nature of federalism. Uh, so it's an interesting question um, as to how sustainable that is, right? Given the strong opinions of different people. But as a political matter in the short term, I predict that it will probably be a serviceable solution. Um, the people in California and New York will look down their noses at the people in Mississippi and South Dakota and Indiana, and they'll say, oh, these, these rubes are, 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 are banning abortion. And the people in those states will look at New York and Illinois and California and say they are monstrous and, and their uh, discrimination against the unborn child. And uh, but I think probably for that that will uh, that will probably be a, at least in the short term a, a serviceable solution. Okay, thank May you. Ask you uh, I'm Father Gregory Holub. I'm professor of philosophy at the Pontifical University of John Paul II in Krakow, in Poland. Although uh, at the moment I'm in the UK, um, in the apartment of uh, Anthony. <laughs> McCarthy. Hi. Nice. <laughs> Helen, hello. Hello. So let me ask you, I think, Professor uh, Steve, that we met a couple of years ago back at yeah. the, the campus of University of Notre Dame. But yeah. I'd like to ask specifically about the reaction of President Biden. But apparently there is um, an attempt to do something against that uh, pronouncement of the high court to, 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 to resist it and maybe even bypass it. Could you tell us what are competences of the president of the United States to do something against it? To what extent can it, uh, can, uh, can he resist that? And, you know, even uh, just introduce abortion uh, in, a, in the back doors, I would say, through the back doors. Is it possible or not? Thank you. I think, uh, I think the president um, is under extraordinary political pressure uh, from his own party to do something. I think they they really are angry and upset about what the Supreme Court has done here. And it wasn't just I mean, the Supreme Court. Again, this is to Ilario's point, has 
uh, reposed authority in the states and has taken and it's funny it's 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 actually I think a less activist role in intervening in in the in the daily affairs across the states uh, and instead reposed authority in in smaller political units. <laughs> but this has been really shocking and upsetting on a variety of issues to uh, to people who identify as liberals and progressives in the United States. And and President Biden is, of course, and I don't mean to suggest President Biden disagrees with his party. He doesn't. He's very much at least recently become a very, very um, ardent supporter of abortion. And um, and so to your question, what can the president do? I think the answer is not much consistent with what the law allows him to do. It doesn't mean that uh, but what he's doing is he's working through primarily through the administrative state. He's reaching out to his agencies. So the executive branch is headed by the president of the United States and then is composed of a variety of administrative agencies and offices that, that report to the president, some of which are tasked with uh, implementing the statutes <coughs> that are passed by Congress that relate to those subject matters. So, for example, the Department of Health and Human Services is, is exists to implement the statutory uh, scheme that Congress passes relating to health and related matters. And so he is, uh, and the Food and Drug Administration, for example, is underneath the Health and Human Services Office. So he's tasking Health and Human Services to find out ways in which they can advocate and support abortion, especially in those jurisdictions where it is uh, going to be severely restricted. Uh, one of the issues that is gonna be very serious uh, is the issue of abortion pills. The idea of chemical abortions and what is a state's authority to forbid the <coughs> the distribution into their state and the use of abortion pills. Now, abortion pills have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration for abortion under the judgment of the FDA that they are safe and efficacious for that purpose. There's a an interesting doctrine called the doctrine of preemption, which says federal law uh, trumps or um, uh, overrides state law in certain circumstances, certain narrow circumstances. And one of those circumstances might be in which the state takes a different view of what the Food and Drug Administration says about safety and efficacy. Even there, I think the, the capacity for preemption uh, of <laughs> state abortion law by the federal agency there is gonna be limited. I think states will be permitted to, to forbid abortion drugs coming into their, into their borders, across their borders, although how to do that is a, is a harder question. How do you, regulate that? How do you enforce that restriction? Um, there was some talk about setting up abortion clinics on federal lands in 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 in, in states that uh, that uh, that ban abortions like on in federal or national parks like Yellowstone National Park, like setting up abortion tents or uh, per creating abortion clinics in in federal prisons or federal military bases. That's a, there's a very complicated area of the law involving a statute about what is the application of state criminal law on the on the on federal lands. Very complicated question. It will certainly come up if they try to pursue that. I find it hard to believe they're going to try to start abortion clinics uh, on on federal lands. I don't think that that would be a political winner for the administration. But you never can tell what they're going to do. Then there's the question of interstate travel. Uh, can women <coughs> travel from? one state to another, can a state forbid the travel? Of, um, and I, I think that's a hard question. I think probably they wouldn't be able to restrict women's free travel across state lines, but they might be able to restrict and regulate those third parties that facilitate travel across state lines. They might be able to restrict advertising in the state of the use of drugs or interventions that are illegal inside of the state. There are interesting First Amendment questions there. Um, so I, I think the I think most of the Biden's Gestures here are are political and are meant to be rhetorical. I don't think that they are necessarily. I, I don't think that they will amount to overriding the states. And then you have to you have to. If I'm the Biden administration, I have to understand that right now in the Supreme Court, there are probably six justices out of nine who would uh, not permit uh, unlawful uh, irrigation of power by the federal government in this way. Thanks very much, uh, Kat. Um, I wonder whether you could say anything about the phenomenon that's 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 got very much to the fore um, at this time, which is uh, progressive opposition to Roe v. Wade. I mean, a lot of people saw um, signs saying "Democrats for Life" and so forth, yeah. or, um, uh, 
it's people very much from the left opposing yeah. Roe v. Wade uh, and calling for sort of better, uh, better responses to women uh, based with an unexpected. Yeah, treatment. no, that's a, um, it's an interesting, sorry, go ahead, please. No, no, you, you go ahead. I, I just wanted to ask, um, ask what you thought the, the prospects were of, of, of bringing, bringing people together on, on, on the issue of the kind of sport that pregnant women should be, should be meeting at times of difficulty. And, yeah, I would certainly hope that there would be the possibility for collaboration. You have the pro-life movement, which in significant part has been focused on um, the political and legal struggle for uh, overturning Roe and Casey, which was a, an obstacle to protecting unborn children in the law in any meaningful way. Um, my my sense of the <clears throat> culture of life movement, insofar as it can be described in a cohesive way like that, um, that there's a real energy for finding ways to care for mothers and babies and families in need, especially in those jurisdictions where you have babies being born who probably otherwise would have been aborted if it wasn't legally restricted. And so I'm optimistic that, that, that there's certainly a lot of grassroots support among the pro-life movement. And as you say, there's a very interesting but 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 um, and relatively new uh, element of the pro-life movement, which identifies itself as progressive, some of which are, um, and these are a lot of, these tend to be younger people. <laughs> There's a really interesting group called the Progressive uh, Anti-Abortion Uprising. Oh no, the Pro-Life and the Progressive. I forget, it's I think it's Pro-Life Anti-Abortion up, Uprising, and these are very, very um, far to the left progressive people, Marxists, anarchists, and so on, who who support uh, the pro-life position. And um, unfortunately, thus far, I've not seen any American politicians endorsing or embracing the progressive pro-life movement. It's it thus far only exists at the grassroots level. I've never seen, um, I'm not aware of a single member of Congress uh, or, or, or uh, there may be people in state legislatures, but I've never seen a single member of Congress or certainly no one in the Biden administration who's ever suggested uh, a, a continuity between the progressive point of view and the pro-life point of view. Um, <clears throat> I hope that that changes, but even more so, I hope that there's an opportunity <clears throat> for people who disagree on the question of abortion <coughs> to agree that we should at the very least provide care for mothers and babies and families who need it now. Um, and for our part at the De Nicola Center at Notre Dame, we've created a new initiative called the Women and Children First Initiative, which will focus on um, teaching research, intellectual formation, public engagement, public service, to try to do our part as a research university to to, to, to contribute to the new landscape in which mothers and babies' families will need help. We're doing a, <clears throat> a study on maternal group homes right now and what works and what doesn't. We're gonna we're gonna <clears throat> we're gonna do that conclude that research and then we're also going to to publicize the results of the research and share it with maternal group homes around the country. We had a panel discussion among pro-life physicians about the need to care for underserved communities, especially communities of color. Um, <clears throat> we were working on housing and questions of employment and poverty and uh, education um, and international human rights. And so we wanna, we wanna find the, the band of overlapping consensus among those on, on the pro-choice and pro-life side who believe that we should put those differences aside and come to the aid of, uh, of, of, of women and children. That's, um, that's something that I hope happens. Although unfortunately on the left politically, I've not seen any politicians embrace that point of view. Although interestingly on the right, there's new movement it seems <clears throat> on, among conservatives to try to embrace more solutions that involve direct government involvement. There's an interesting proposed law uh, by um, Senators Marco Rubio and Lee to pr provide paid parental leave and tax exemptions and uh, support for addiction recovery and so on. Um, uh, in the recent, and I'll share it with you, I haven't seen in the Washington Post recently, Marianne Glennon and I uh, wrote a uh, an op-ed sort of detailing what we think is a good program and reflecting on what uh, it promising beginnings might look like around the country on, the, on that score. <clears throat> Are we out of time? Just... Uh, no, no, please go ahead. Carter, I was wondering what you think the um, implications of the Dobbs decision might be for regulating IVF industries or embryonic uh, stem cell research. Yeah. We saw That's something come up and there was worries about that. My friends at bioethics centers across the country are talking about that. What do you think about that? 
Yeah, I, I, I don't see that as as being a, an issue. First of all, the one thing to notice is that there's never been, the, I mean, states have always had the authority to regulate IVF and embryo research. Like there, there's never been an absence of that authority. And in fact, you do see some states like Louisiana, for example, has for <clears throat> decades declared the in vitro embryo to be a juridical person. And they still practice IVF in Louisiana. They just have, they have different strictures that they have to follow. They have a definition of death that involves the failure to, the cell, cellular division after a certain period of time when they thaw the embryo. Um, and uh, and so, the, but the, the deeper point is, and I've written about this elsewhere, the, is the way criminal law works in the United States is you cannot criminalize something incidentally. Like that's not, that's not permitted as a, as a matter of due process. Uh, it, that would be void for vagueness. You have to set forth explicitly what it is that you are restricting. And um, and we've had cases come up in Indiana where there was a feticide statute that related to third party interventions that caused the death of an unborn child. Um, and, and the prosecutor tried to use it against a woman who attempted to self-manage an abortion in the court, in that opinion, invalidated the prosecutor's action saying, you, we don't we don't criminalize things by accident in the, in the United States. So we have a very, very specific requirement to set forth with particularity what it is that that you are what you're restricting and and um, and as a political matter, I don't see a lot of appetite, even in those states that want to restrict abortion, to do anything on the embryo question or the IVF question. I've seen no movement in that direction. I've never seen a prosecutor talk about that. I can understand why people are nervous about that because they they're worried about the the changed circumstances. I think some people are taking advantage of that nervousness by 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 ske sketching out like a, a kind of parade of horribles of what's going to happen now that that states have the authority to regulate abortion more restrictively than they did before but there's never been as i say there's never been in the absence of authority to restrict or ban ivf or uh, uh, or embryo research very few states have done it and true and as a matter of politics what i've observed is the only people that are well funded uh, enough to inf influence state legislatures, and the IVF question is the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. They're they have a very well funded and very elaborate and sophisticated group led by um, Sean Tipton, and they are active in all fifty state legislatures. And I've never seen any successful effort to restrict IVF. All right, well. Uh, thank you guys for having me. Uh, it's been a pleasure seeing all of you and um, come visit us at the University of Notre Dame. We have uh, conferences and academic programming and you'd all be welcome to join us and, and hope you guys, uh, We the, most specifically, we have uh, uh, our fall conference, which some of you have been to. Uh, it's a big interdisciplinary conference um, every fall, every November. And uh, this, it's always around, organized around a broad humanistic theme. And this year, the theme is creation. Uh, which could include a wide variety of topics by design. And uh, please uh, submit your ideas uh, for, for or proposals. We'd love to see you uh, on campus at Notre Dame in November. Thank you very much. Well, th thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Carter, um, uh, for a very interesting uh, talk and discussion. And uh, yes, perhaps we'll see you again, whether whether here or, or, um, or in America. So, um, All right. And uh, thank you very, very much, everyone, for coming. Um, please do follow us on, um, on Facebook. If there in the chat um and uh we look forward to seeing you again take care everybody thank you very much thank you thank you very much bye bye bye